Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Profiles in Risk. I am your host, Nick Lamparelli. I am very pleased on this morning to uh, be able to talk to and introduce Mark Haversack. Mark is the Director of Risk Management at the MGM Grand Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas, Nevada. Mark, thank you so much for coming on. Well, thank you, Nick. It's a privilege and an honor to be asked to be on the show. So um, appreciate let's, get, let, let's get going. <laughs> yeah, let's get going. Uh, I, I, I didn't uh, ask, I didn't put this question on the agenda, but I thought about it last night when I was talking to my wife. And I think it's the question that probably everyone on, that's listening to this is probably wondering. And that is, uh, how many times a year do you get asked about Ocean's Eleven? <laughs> Actually, that's a good question. I've never been asked that question at all. I can't believe that. That was the fir- that's the first one of the first things I thought about, especially when I was typing up the agenda. I'm like, okay, where do I squeeze this in? But in talking to my wife, it was the first thing that came on her mind. She's like, oh, you should ask you should ask him about Ocean's Eleven and whether his boss is like Andy Garcia. No, no, my boss is the furthest thing from that. <laughs> you know, you got the fiction thing and and the action thing with Ocean's Eleven, and of course it's been remade, and then and then of course they actually did uh, other movies, you know, Ocean's Twelve and so on. So uh, I, I guess it's a good sell factor for Hollywood, and that's probably about where it is. Yeah. Uh, well, let's let's jump in. Uh, I, I I have a feeling another Ocean's Eleven question will pop up as we're talking about this, but uh, <laughs> let's let's go ahead and jump in and talk about your role as the director of risk management uh, for a very large casino. So, um, could you talk a little bit uh, initially in what is your responsibilities? What do you do on a day to day basis? It's probably almost better to say what I don't do. Because okay. I, I touch every single department within the property. Uh, not only do I have the MGM Grand, I also have the signature condominiums and Grand Laundry. We actually have a laundry facility in town as well. Uh, obviously, being one of the largest hotels in the world, there's a lot of back of the house uh, functions that, that need to go on. Uh, essentially, we're probably not much different than a city within itself. A lot of people that I've actually taken on a tour in the back of the house areas are just amazed at the amount of things that go on in the back of the house. One thing, which is a big benefit and perk to all our employees, is we feed our employees every day. Uh, in the back of the house. So when you figure I've got over 7,500 employees roughly here and we're feeding them 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, we never shut down. Uh, So, and and the meals are kind of a buffet style and you pick and choose what you want. On top of that, when we look at departments and so on that I have to touch, uh, you have security, legal, marketing, slots, gaming, cable gaming, poker, entertainment. So we have obviously shows here. We have Ka, we have David Copperfield, we have the Jabberwockies, we have the Grand Garden Arena with, that's hosted many of the major events that happen in, in Las Vegas from entertainment concert venues to boxing to MMA. Uh, We also host major conferences and conventions, both in our conference center and the Grand Garden Arena. Our engineering department, people don't realize we have paint shops, tile shops, carpet shops, carpentry shops, plumbing shops, uh, all, all down here in this massive basement area. We have uh, guest services, we have reservation departments, we have a uniform department. All these people have to get their uniforms that work in the front facing positions. So we provide those uniforms to those employees, uh, or at least in in some areas, parts of those uniforms on it. When you figure how many restaurants we have, the amount of food, the warehousing, the problems with supply chain, 
which is a risk that, that we also have to deal with being able to get the items in. Remember, we're in the middle of a desert. We don't, mm -hmm. we don't have the accessibility to grow our own fish and <laughs> those kind yeah. of things. We have to bring all that in from uh, outside sources into the desert. Uh, so yes, traditional risk management, uh, claims that's always uh, one thing, insurance, reviewing certificates of insurance, looking at transfers of risk. Oh, the, the list is almost uh, infinite in terms of what we're getting into. Our marketing department comes up with some real strange stuff sometimes, and it gets run by both risk and safety. Because again, we also, because we're so large, we have a, a, a full-time safety department here as well because we have to deal with all the regulatory OSHA issues, workers' comp, employee benefits. We have HR, yeah. finance. Finance is big. We're, one of, we're actually more regulated in many cases than a nuclear power plant because of the amount of money that comes through a casino, a typical casino hotel. Um, we're constantly in an audit phase from many levels. Even in risk management, uh, I had the pleasure of working with the students at UNLV in their finance department. They formed a, an insurance club, and we actually provided uh, uh, a scholarship opportunity for a team of UNLV students, and they did an ERM project, Enterprise Risk Management. Mm -hmm. And so I had the opportunity to talk with the class, and most of these students are finance students. But ironically, a lot of these students were looking at insurance and looking at uh, actuarial things to do. Um, even most seasoned finance professionals don't quite understand the actuarial process and what it does. Uh, forensic accounting is another issue when you have a catastrophic event. We have to deal with how do we resolve these catastrophic events for our own property and a lot of times you need to utilize a forensic accountant to determine what your losses actually are based on what your profit and loss would have been during that period of time that you may be shut down yeah. so as you can see there's a lot of different responsibilities and it changes day to day i could come in planning on doing something and i might not get to it for two or three days because something comes up and it could be as little as somebody bringing in a tarantula into their room <laughs> and then trying to claim we are overrun by a tarantula. <laughs> do, do, you ever, do you ever get to sleep? That's my next question. You know, we have great trained people here and it's part of risk. It's, it's also part of our job to train our people. Yes, I'm on call 24 hours a day. Yes, there are moments, especially during our busy times, I might be called uh, in the middle of the night, but that's not as often as one might think these days. I generally work Monday through Friday. If we have a concert or major event on the weekend, I'll be here during the weekend. That's just the nature of the beast, and I've been doing it for so many years, I don't even think anything of it. So being visible being here. But remember, risk isn't that frontline security person or that responder. Risk is really, you're cleaning up after the fact uh, and, and you're putting it all back together for those incidents that, that might occur. So you're actually needed more on that back end as you are on the front end, but you help prepare for the front end, whether it's a mass casualty issue, or mass incident issue, or, or, or we're having a huge event, and you're going to have 20, 30,000 people coming for an event. Yeah, so I, I want to go into that, because to me, that's the art of risk management, right, is um, trying to uncover all of the different risks that you have, and you're, you know, you're at the MGM casino, so as you, as you mentioned, it's almost infinite. Um, how do you, and how, you know, the, the balance between trying to prevent those from happening, if they do happen, trying to mitigate those from happening, and if you can't mitigate them, trying to transfer that. Um, could you talk a little bit about how, how you do that? What's, what does your planning process look like, and how, 
um, how, how do you proportion out uh, prevention from mitigation to transfer and everything in between? Well, that, that's a great question. And that's really a very loaded question for mm -hmm. sure. Um, first off, with today's technology, it does help risk management a great deal because we have a lot of statistics, maybe even an overload at times of statistics. So we have to identify where the trends are, what's happening, uh, whether it's in the guest rooms, whether it's on our floor surfaces, whether it's uh, food issues, and so on. So we are able to go back and look historically at what's going on and where those trends are. So we can kind of gauge, gauge a game plan to see how we're going to address issues. So as an example, if I had a lot of car thefts out of the valet area, the question is what's going on in valet? What mm -hmm. changed? How come we're having that incident? And again, this is all theoretical, of course. So as, as a typical risk professional, the issue is what is the procedure? How is the procedure done? Has anything changed in the procedure if there was something in place? If there's nothing in place, what do we do working with the department and the people that have to do this job on a day-to-day -day basis to figure out what can we do to make that area much more secure? How do we secure the keys? How do we ensure that the right person is getting the right vehicle and those types of things? Uh, that's on it. So that's a typical thing. The next thing is, is we're, we're self-insured. So when you say that, you're self-insured actually to a certain level, then, then you actually have excess coverage. So one, we're the author of our own destiny in many cases, because we may never get to that point where we have to bring in a third party carrier or insurance. So we, you know, typical and basic risk is, is you're looking at what the trends are, what could happen. It's almost looking at doing a heat map, doing a risk assessment of each area. Does each department have policies? Do they have procedures? Do they have standard operating procedures and functions that they follow? And reviewing those and tightening those up. And it's also getting everyone together at a higher level, like a director, vice president's level, to break down the silos, what's important to each area. And as a risk professional, you have to understand what's important to each area, because every area thinks they're the most important. <laughs> and, and in reality, for what they do, they are important. Uh, we've often said that the person cleaning the restroom is as important as the person dealing the cards because the last thing you want is a guest to go into a dirty restroom on it. So, and for guests when they have to use a restroom, that is the most important thing at that point to the guest. I want a clean, wholesome environment that I can go in there and not have to worry. So we need to figure out as risk professionals at, at any organization, where our strong points are, where, we, where can we build on those, where is the weakest point and how do we move that bar up? How do we address that? So by looking at the trends, talking to the department, reviewing what the department does, you can then gauge exactly how everything is, is functioning and it then gives you an opportunity to hopefully affect some changes that could ultimately reduce the uh, risk. So if you have a lot of slip and falls, what are you doing about the slip and falls? Is it the carpet? Is it the tile? Is it the transitions? Is it uh, slip coefficient products? Is it signage? Is it scheduling? Is it employees making sure you have enough people out there to take care of a spill or whatever? Those are things you got to kind of think about all the time and look at the different areas. And we do that by seeing those trends. So yeah. if I have... I have a lot of slip and falls in particular in a particular area. The question is, let's go out there and take a look at that area. Let's see what we can do. Let's bring the department in as well. And let's have that discussion on the table. And nothing is off the table. We have that discussion every day, depending on what we're going to do. 
marketing is another good example on risk. They want to bring in exotic animals to an event. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not kidding. What, what, could, what could go wrong? <laughs> yeah, not, yeah, exactly. What could go wrong? What could go wrong with the person doing the, the fire thing, uh, juggling chainsaws, <laughs> doing these different things? Uh, that's out there. So you have to kind of weigh out what that risk is and, and how, how do we make it as safe as we can and still maintain an entertainment factor for our guests. Yeah. So I hope I answered some of that for you. Yeah, you did. You did. And, and so uh, you know, as an insurance professional, the next, uh, the next question is just, I think, natural from how you described it because, you know, since you're so – since you are the author of your own destiny to quote your words um, and you do self-insure so much risk, um, do you, do you put the importance of insurance to be more catastrophic? Like, do you think of insurance and risk transfer at more in the aggregate, basically like, okay, we're, we're willing to retain a significant amount of risk. And after that, we just want to make sure that there's some kind of financial coverage there or do you parse it out and like really spend a lot of time, um, you know, siphoning off the insurance? We, you know, we want a little bit of this or not too much of that. How do, how do you think about the risk transfer given how much uh, responsibility you have internally uh, financially? Well, a great question. Now, MGM is a huge major company, one of the largest in the world. So, insurance is actually even not handled at our property levels. They're actually handled from our corporate level. Um, but as with any company, you have to sit down and determine what your appetite for the risk. So do you want to retain the risk? Do you want to transfer that risk into other means? And that could be everything from not just insurance, but in contractual agreements, indemnification agreements, uh, waivers of subrogation. There, there are so many different tools that are that are out there that that are available to the risk professional and the business itself. And a good risk professional can get into that C-suite, can have that conversation with the chief financial officer, or your president, or the vice president or senior vice presidents within your own organization to determine just how much appetite do we really have for taking on risk? Some companies, it may be 100% insurance. Other companies, we may take on a large, uh, small deductible to a large deductible program and still have insurance in place. When I deal with the signature, that's a condominium complex. Yes, there are room rentals there and it's a very beautiful property, but that's a whole different program that's a that's an insured product program there because there's an HOA involved, there's residents that own those units, uh, as well as the fact that we also have a rental program over there. So it it varies, and there's no gaming over there at the signature. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So when you look at insurance versus loss prevention, it goes hand in hand. It's probably almost in, in some cases a 50-50 deal that you're spending time. I review certificates of insurance from vendors, tenants, um, groups that are coming in to hold conferences, um, people that marketing wants to bring in to do different things, entertainment, and so on. So, you got to make sure that A, the contractual agreements are tight, B, they have the insurance, and not just a certificate of insurance. Is there an endorsement that shows that they actually are covering you? Because that COI isn't really worth anything if there's mm -hmm. nothing to back that up. Mm -hmm. So a lot of risk people, uh, especially young ones starting out in the business, they don't realize that a certificate of insurance, although it's great to have it, uh, that may not be what you're thinking you're actually getting because it, A, it, it comes down to what's in the contract and B, what's in the endorsements of, of their insurance. Yeah. Uh, wh what make, what do you think makes a good risk manager? Wow. You know, it depends on how far along you are in your career. <laughs> what, what should, I guess what, so I, 
what should a young uh, budding risk manager think about uh, in terms of um, being more effective? I'm going to give you two words that I've lived by since I was a young guy. And I wasn't even in this business. Be flexible. That's very important. Be flexible. One of the things about risk and safety professionals, especially in my early years, and, and I'm glad I never adopted that because I actually came from operations. I didn't grow up, I didn't, as a child, I didn't grow up to say I'm going to be a risk manager. <laughs> so a good risk manager doesn't tell you you can't do it. A good risk manager says, let's see how we can make this work. And that's the difference. So it was, it, it was kind of weird. I was being tested by a CFO a few years back to wanted to kind of gauge what my thought process was uh, on risk and how I approach risk. So this question came out of the blue. And this is a true story here. The risk, uh, this, the, this executive said, I want to dance on that table. And he pointed to this coffee table in the office. And he says, so as the risk manager, what do you, you know, what's your thoughts on that? Now, what he was looking for was to see, was I rigid enough to say, no, you can't get on the table. That's just not acceptable. Stay off the table. And I think that's what, that's what he actually was thinking I was going to say. So he was absolutely shocked when I turn around and say, well, let's look at this table for a minute. So we're staring at the table and I'm going, okay, so are you trained to get up on the table? Have you had, can we uh, look at the table? Can we transfer the risk if the table fails? Is the table able to support your weight? Is there a way we can transfer this risk? If not, um, what kind of training, what safety things do we have to take a look at? But at the end of the day, if you want to get on that table, here's, here's your options. We can either allow you to get on the table, we can train you to do it safely and effectively, we can reinforce the table to ensure there won't be any damage to the table and you won't get hurt, and, and, or we can ensure for this particular thing that you want to do. So I gave him options, and as a risk professional, it's not just to say no, it's to give the options. If you want to do this, this is how we're going to do it uh, or, or suggest this is how we should do it and, and line up those different scenarios that will allow them to make a, a rational decision on what they want to do. Finally, in the end, I pull the dollar bill out and says, well, if you get on the table, here you go. Uh, I, was hoping it was, I was hoping you were going to take it there. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you got to have uh, some uh, levity. You got you, you to show the humor part of it. Uh, unfortunately, you can't see my office, but there's like squeeze toys and all kinds of little things in here because a lot of times, uh, especially in, on the claim side, when a guest doesn't want to hear what you have to say or denying something, you you, you got to have a, a thick skin because people will tell you because they don't like what you're saying. So they're going to tell you things that 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 you can't take personal. The job is not personal. A lot of young professionals, and, and even when I was in operations, I remember uh, in my food and beverage days, I was working for a, a hotel chain uh, that also had a food chain. And this person came in and faked a slip and fall. Mm -hmm. uh, actually saw him put a tomato on the floor and then lay down. And I was livid that the risk department came in and looked at it and then offered to settle it with this individual. And I'm like, the dude faked it. <laughs> and um, it took me a while to understand that if this becomes a claim, it, it's out of control. If it becomes a litigated matter, it's even more out of control. The moment it becomes a litigated matter, 
you, you got to put a dollar amount to that because an attorney then is involved. So that, that's like five grand right there. Can I put this to bed for $200, $250 and get rid of it? Or do I want to stand firm and deny everything and then start paying five, 10, 20, 25 grand just to try to get a claim resolved just on principle? on it. I'm not saying to roll over by any means, but there are well, ways of ne negotiating that. So that, that how, how do you about. avoid, how do you avoid the, you know, the obvious problem that uh, either that guy's going to come back and try to pull the same stunt or he's going to whisper in someone's ear or you get a big sign on your back that's a, you know, a target that says, you know, uh, fake something. These guys will just settle. How do you avoid that part of it? Well, those are business decisions that are made. If you look at some of the most successful companies like Coca-Cola, Disney, uh, and so on, when they when they look at claims, they're they're not looking just at claims. They're looking at the guest experience on it. Yes, it's a small percentage of those that that want to pull something or get over on something. I've often gotten it from the workers' comp side that every person that has a work comp claim is faking. And it, it over the years, I've had to spend a lot of time educating our management staff that when you think about how many employees actually have an injury over the years, how many of those are actually pulling one over on you. I mean, I, I, after 30 years, I probably can count on one hand, maybe two, those that want to try to get over on the system. But there are thousands of others that actually entered the system, got through the system, and came out of the system. Mm -hmm. You can't, I, I mean, people are going to do what people do. Everyone today in their homes, they're victims or, or could become potential victims for every kind of spam, scam, rip-off scheme that you could think of. The good thing about technology is, is if John Doe has an incident today, and then John Doe actually goes to another one of our properties and has the same incident at that property, our database is going to bring John Doe up, and we're going to see that. So we may have settled it at one point, but at another point, we're going to say, you know, there's something funny about this because you had this happen over there. Now you got it over here and you're trying it again over at another place. Also, as part of a risk professional group, we all get together monthly through our RIMS chapter and Nevada Self-Insured Association. And don't think we don't talk. <laughs> so we all kind of know what's going on up and down yeah. the strip and the trends on the strip. A big, a big scam that was out there for a while was the one where the guy calls and he says, you know, we were at your restaurant Beautiful. The server was great. Food was outstanding. Uh, the ambience was great. However, the uh, the food server spilt some wine, got on my wife's dress, mm -hmm. and the wine won't come out. Um, or it cost me fifty dollars or twenty dollars to get the wine out. Well, you know, on the service, hey, we're sorry about that. Here, we'll get you reimbursed for that. No problem. We were starting to see a trend up and down the Las Vegas Strip of that happening at all our restaurants. And the same people were pulling that Oof. on it. So there comes a point where, well, we're going to need to see this dress. We need to see the backup, the receipts. We need to understand exactly what's going on with it. So uh, that, that, that kind of put it to bed there when you started asking for more things. And, and so there are ways that, that that can be controlled without having to get into this big confrontational thing. Yeah. Yeah. You hinted at a prior career before risk management. So I'd like to, uh, you know, dig in a little bit more on why you chose it one, but your career path, how did you get to become director? What kind of personality does it take to become a director for a large corporation? So first off, 
Uh, how did you transition? What was attractive about risk management that you decided to step into that? Oh, I got suckered into this. Oh, great. <laughs> Just like the rest not, of us. I did not. You know, today it's, it's actually a lot different today. And, and this, a lot of the schools are now looking at risk management curriculums and degrees. Uh, it, it's gotten very big uh, from the East Coast to the Midwest. And now the West Coast is starting to embrace that for students. And, and it actually is refreshing to see that it's being looked upon seriously as actually a career out of college uh, or, or even discussions uh, when you go and mentor or do career days at the high schools because it's not something that as a child you think about when you're a little child, what are you going to grow up to be? I'm going to be a fireman. I'm going to be an astronaut. I'm going to be a jet pilot those kind of things and you don't really look at well what's the realization of what you really might be those are great aspirations and for those that work hard and achieve it that's outstanding i was actually in the food and beverage industry from a, a young age and uh continued on that path i actually also served in the military and when i got out i went back into food and beverage uh, operations and, and had a 17 year career in food and beverage. Now that kind of is a good thing because as an operations person, I probably look at risk differently than somebody who's never been in operations. Mm -hmm. So if you've never been in operations and you're in risk, one of the things I strongly recommend is, is go spend some time in those departments or those areas and actually work those jobs side by side with people for a week or two so you understand those jobs. I was working as the food and beverage manager at a large casino and the casino industry almost 30 years ago, yeah, it's probably been 30 years now, <laughs> They, they gave you the opportunity to explore other areas within your career path. So there was an obscure posting on a bulletin board that said, we're looking for someone from operations for a temporary 18 month position in human resources. You'll learn human resource functions and your primary duties are employee parties. Well, I knew how to party. <laughs> I'm in operations. Yeah, in the liquor in the so, liquor department. So yeah, yeah. So yeah, let me let me apply for this. And there was about 200 of us that actually applied, and I interviewed and got it. Now, one of the key things: Are you outgoing? Do you have an outgoing personality? Do you uh, are, are you very guest service oriented? And from the service industry, you have to be. I mean, you're not going to survive in that industry. So I, I did get the position. So here I am looking great. I now not on these graveyard shifts. I'm not on holidays. I'm not on weekends. It's a Monday mm -hmm. through Friday. Great gig deal, right? So I show up to work on my first day of work. And I'm sitting in the office. And I'm like, I guess I better plan a party or something. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. And they wheel in a file cabinet and they slap an OSHA log on the desk and they said, here you go. And I said, what's this? And they said, workers comp. And I said, who? <laughs> I didn't know what it was. I mean, I knew that there was a procedure. Somebody got hurt. So that was kind of the start. Uh, I, I then got into employee relations, recruitment, training, uh, benefits. And I was one of the first to package workers' comp as a benefit. I thought senior management would hit the floor and die on me when I said we need to package this as a benefit because technically it really is a benefit. Let's embrace it and let's show people how to use it. Uh, and, and actually, in the end, we'll have less workers' comp because they'll understand the whole process. And it actually worked. So uh, from there, I kind of got. Uh, then I got the safety piece, then I got the general liability piece, and it just kind of grew from there. So that temporary 18-month job has turned into 30 years <laughs> of risk management uh, on it. But uh, one, the Risk and Insurance Management Society has been absolutely great. Um, short term is RIMS. Yep. 
Uh, I actually am one of the founders of the Nevada chapter here uh, in Nevada. Uh, we've drawn the chapter. We've celebrated 30 years now of, of service. Uh, we have continued. We just had 11% growth in our membership this last year. We've gotten involved with UNLV more so than we ever have. We're already a benefactor for the amount of money we've raised for UNLV. But we've taken it to the next level where we're actually working with students and and going into the classroom and talking about risk management risk careers setting up a scholarship program so that uh, they form up in teams and we give them projects so we had them do an erm project uh, on whatever angle they wanted to go through but it was on um, boys town and we wanted them to identify the risk and come up with methods that we might be able to mitigate or reduce the risk based on what the things that Boys Town does. And they're a remarkable organization onto themselves. Uh, you can go to their website and see all the things that they're involved with. On it. And it was great. The students loved it. Uh, we had a lot of interaction with the students, a lot of questions. And they put on some magnificent presentations. So since we helped them, we weren't the judges. We actually brought in the CPCU Society mm -hmm. to actually become the judges. So they actually presented to them. And they decided which group was the best group. Nice. That group then all each got scholarships. We've also uh, worked with uh, a lot of diversity and in Nevada, in Southern Nevada, the county has a program for disadvantaged businesses, women-owned businesses, minority-owned businesses, where these business owners who want to start or have started a business can do um, like a 13-week course through the county. We're part of that program where we come in and we talk about risk management, safety, OSHA, insurance, um, some of the benefits side, HR side. We kind of talk a little bit about all that along with other professionals throughout the community from banking, finance, and so on to these business owners because our hope is, A, we want them to be successful. B, I'm planting the seed because as you grow and become more successful, that's going to possibly open up more jobs for risk professionals, yep. safety professionals. And then they're going to remember us and they're going to say, you need to join RIMS. You need to do this. You need to do that. So it's developing that partnership at a core level early on in their businesses. And it's remarkable to see how these businesses are thriving and growing because of this program and and it, it, it makes you feel really good in there um, so between the networking the education that you can get uh, there's a lot of different education things continuing education education's life lifelong when you get out of school if you think you're done then yeah you're done you're not going to go anywhere in well, your can, career can, can we talk about that a little bit um you know, specifically, as you're talking, you brought you hinted at a few things, including having conversations with C-level executives, which means there's a potential sales pitch. There's uh, a way to prepare your information. The, uh, you talked about data and trends. Um, I'm assuming those are the uh, there's some soft skills and hard skills, but those are the types of things you have to continuously fine tune. Um, if you wanted to, you know, become uh, a risk management executive? Well, a great question. Now, I don't know exactly how uh, education, of course, is, is, is by far an excellent thing, just so you understand the concepts, you understand the, the, the core things and the advanced things when it gets into risk, strategic risk management, enterprise risk management. Uh, and so on and you have to stay up on the trends so you know lately we hear a lot about blockchain and and, and those kind of things mm -hmm. but one of the important keys in, in successful risk management and communication is is you got to understand who your audience is so talking to a supervisor or manager is one thing and you got to keep it 
simple and and you got to get that buy-in from them so that they're going to do what they got to do. C-suite executives, they need to understand the big, broader picture. And as a risk person, you have to understand the big, broader picture. You may not like everything that you see that goes on around you or within the company, but at the end of the day, you got to understand there's a bigger picture here. You also need to understand what is their sweet spots, if you want to call it that. So presenting to the president is different than presenting to the finance guy. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that uh, impressed in my earlier years in risk management, because again, nobody knows where risk management fits in an organization. (laughs) Some it's their own department, others it's HR, security, legal, finance. You're the guy that says no. (laughs) <laughs> well, I'm not the guy that says no. I'm the guy that gives you the options, actually. But be flexible. But but because you got to be flexible. But yeah. the thing is, is that you need to tell, you need to tell the story to the audience, and you need to know what what they like to see. So my CFO loves graphs. He's not so much on wanting to see the nth degree numbers, you know, yeah. see number by number thing, he sees enough of those. But to get that picture on a graph and those comparisons on a graph, that floats his boat. That gets yeah. him to go, wow, okay, I understand this and I see this. And and then you're also then augmenting that with, here's our options. And this is what I would recommend. But you understand even a picture probably larger than I understand. So what are your thoughts on it? By him giving you his thoughts, then he's got instant buy-in because then it's like, oh, okay. Legal is another way. When when you're talking to your legal people, they want to hear both sides of the argument. They just don't want your side. They want to know how it could come back the other way. Uh, one attorney told me a, a great attorney, uh, you know, there are good attorneys and there are great attorneys. The great attorneys counter argue the whole process. So when you come up with what you're going to do, you want to then step back and be the other guy and how you're going to fight all that. If you can understand that, then you can come up with even a better defense or a better strategy on the other side. So you have to take all these lessons that you're learning and you got to understand the people that you're dealing with uh, on it. So is it a return on investment? Because when you're talking to the hotel VP, it's like he wants to know what the return on investment is. If I got to replace all the shower chairs on the property, what is my return on investment? Uh Is it a reduction in in issues because the chairs are old and they're not maintained? (laughs) Or is it uh, for better service uh, to our guests? It, you you got to present it in a way that gets them to provoke that thought based on what they do and what they're specializing in. Engineering, what's that doing to the building and what impact will that have in three years or five years from now concerning the building? So again, you got to kind of understand who you're dealing with, how you want them to give you that buy-in that's in it. And you got to listen. You got to listen to what they're telling you. Don't just assume that you know it all. To be honest, I don't know it all. And I will tell you that. And I've been in this business 30 years. I don't know it all. I depend on people to tell me things to educate me as well as I'm trying to help educate and, and teach all the people I deal with on a day-to-day basis, which brings me to a quick little story. A bunch of reporters were interviewing Albert Einstein, and one of the reporters asked Albert Einstein, and this is a true story, one of the reporters asked Albert Einstein, I want to follow up with you. Can I give you a call next week and and we can follow up on some, some stuff I want to talk about? And Albert said, sure. No problem. So the reporter said, well, what's your number? He was shocked that Albert Einstein walked over to a cabinet and pulled out a phone book. For you millennials, that's a book that actually had phone numbers in it. (laughs) And he opened up the phone book and he read off his phone number. 
And the reporter stood there as shocked as could be and says, you're the father of relativity. You created stuff that we could never even think about. And you don't know your own phone number. And his response back to the reporter was so classic. He said, I don't clutter my mind with facts I don't need. I just need to know where to get them. Yep. That's what risk does. You need to know where to go get them. You need to know how to research. You need to know how to go get them. You need to be able to network with your peers because they may have done exactly what you're trying to do. You don't need to reinvent wheels in a lot of cases because you can look at best demonstrated practices. Like you that. hit on something a, a few minutes ago about selling. Risk management is about selling. Risk management is, you know, here's the thing. Executives, management, if you go to them and you say, what does risk management do? If they can't tell you, you didn't do your job as a risk manager because you didn't sell yourself. Mm. You need to continually sell yourself. And a good marketing person says your last campaign was great but you can't rest on your laurels. You have to come up with the next thing. You got to keep moving forward. That's what risk has to do. You just can't say, hey, I do this, this, and this, and all of a sudden at the end of the day, you go back and you say, yeah, I told them everything I did. I'm kicking back. I got my feet up on the desk. I'm going. That doesn't work. Everything changes. We change day to day. Risk we had 20 and 30 years ago, are different today as they are 20, 30 years ago. Yeah. Do some things cycle back around? Yeah, it sure does. I saw stuff from the 1970s uh, on a, uh, in, in a uh, clothing store, and I'm like, really, they're coming back? No, <laughs> please. So, okay. I love yeah, that. The, yeah, I love yeah. That. that. That's a that's a great answer. I was uh, I was hoping you would go in that direction. Um, out of respect for your time. Um, I want to transition to uh, a couple of personal questions I ask everyone that comes on the podcast. Uh, the first of which is, uh, I, 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 I like this one because I'm really interested to see how much time you actually spend away from the casino. Uh, when you aren't working, what do you enjoy doing? Well, I have a motorcycle, so uh, I, I love riding. Um, where I live in, in Las Vegas, I'm, I'm right next to the Lake Mead National Recreation Area. I live by a place called Lake Las Vegas. So it's absolutely beautiful and gorgeous. Uh, I'll take rides. I'll stop. I'll actually take pictures of longhorn sheep and, 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 and great views back from where you're at back toward the city. Las Vegas is such a beautiful area. And then, you know, people, when they come here, they just kind of focus on the strip. There's just so much more about Southern Nevada that I've fallen in love with. Uh, Cause originally I'm from Detroit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. Like, uh, I don't do snow, so <laughs> I can see the snow in the mountains. And, and what's cool is you could be jet skiing uh, out at Lake Mead, and then you can go up and go snowboarding up at Mount Charleston. So it's you kind of get the best of all worlds. So I love to ride, uh, 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 take cruises. We, uh, My wife and I go on cruises uh, quite a bit. Um, you got to carve out a balance of work life uh, and, and take that time. Good thing about a cruise ship is you got no phone service, <laughs> so they can't call you. Yeah. You might you might get in day when you get back, but for the most part, they can't call you uh, on it. But if you have great trained people, they're going to work through these things, and you always have a backup. So. Uh, I'll have a fellow director at another property. Hey, if there's an emergency, you got that covered for me. Yeah, and I cover for them when they're gone too. Yeah, that's good. Uh, so, that's good risk management. Yeah, I mean, it's just prudent at what you do. But I got a, I got an outstanding staff. I couldn't ask for a better staff than I got here. Uh, they're seasoned. They know what they're doing. Um, they all have very good, strong things that they can do. And as a team and harmony, they do. And I have a very diverse staff. So I'm, I'm all for the diversity part uh, of the business. And I don't look at people that do the same things. I actually look for people that are stronger suits in different areas because mm -hmm. that's how you become better at what you do. 
I love learning. So I, um, Hillsdale College, I've taken some of those courses, learned about the Federalist Papers. I love history, uh, the Constitution, and so on. Um, so again, I learn in different areas. It's not always just learning about risk management uh, because uh, there's so much more of the world that's out there. And I've had the opportunity in my business to actually work throughout the world. So I got to open Sky City in Auckland, New Zealand. Uh, opened a casino in Australia, worked in Tasmania. Yes, I've held a Tasmanian devil. So before puberty, they're cute. You can hold them. <laughs> uh, opened uh, casinos in England, the Bahamas, even uh, got to work with a cruise ship uh, when our company had owned one, not the company I'm at now, another company, river boats, Indian gaming. There's just so many different facets, even within our own industry. Uh, and, and I'm blessed because I've had the opportunity to go and work in these different environments and, and get properties opened and, and look at, look back and go, wow, I was part of that. So it, yeah. it's a real rewarding career. That's great. That's great. Um, are there any, uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure how you function, uh, given everything that you have to do. Uh, and you know, I don't know how you sleep given everything you have to do. So are there any tools or techniques that you find valuable that help you stay productive and or organized? You know, over the years, you just kind of, you kind of figure out, well, what's the priorities? A good thing, a good example is if you come into work and you say you got 400 emails, which is not mm -hmm. uncommon for me. So I come in. First thing I do is, is I weed out anything that I, I just don't need to deal with uh, that's on it. So I get that down to a better core. Uh, then I look and prioritize what I have left and deal with the things I got to deal with and then pick up on the things later. Today, with the internet and, and uh, LinkedIn is, is very good. There's a thing called LinkedIn Learning. And they've actually got some great productivity courses on getting you organized and helping keeping you organized because I mean when you think about it 30 years ago we were using those little books and mm -hmm. uh, uh, I some of them still are <laughs> okay <laughs> but you know you, those organizational books and so on yeah. to kind of figure out uh, what you're doing and do your priorities and your to-do list and, and, and those kind of things today you can do that all through Microsoft Outlook spreadsheets, uh, different task sheets, and, and, and so on. So I know that during the month, I have to do certain things on certain days that have to be done. So you have your year-end reports or month-end reports. Your, uh, you come in after the weekend, you got to get through all the claims or incidents that have occurred over the weekend and those kind of things. So you, you're kind of gauged it. Okay, I know that on Monday, I'm going to have to deal with this. Um, other things may come in that may take you away from it, but by the end of the day, you got to kind of get all these things. Mm -hmm. If if you can walk away, and, and the idea is so you can walk away at four, five, six o'clock, you leave the office and you leave the office. In other words, you're not thinking about, well, I got to do this tomorrow, I got to do that. That's so hard if to you do, do, Mark. You, well, it That's is, but so after, you, after, after you've been doing it for so many years, you kind of figure it out. And, and, and maybe that's just because you're seasoned enough to go, I can leave the office. Now, is there times I got to take a project home? Is there something I got to do? Yes, it, it, that's without saying. That happens uh, out there. So, uh, but, but again, you, you don't want to sacrifice the work-life uh, component. Yeah. And in, in, because of my generation, we have a lot of loyalty to our employers and we give a lot to our employers. And there, there has been some sacrifice for home life. Uh, if I did it all over again, I would probably have done it differently, knowing what I know now, if I had that knowledge back then. But it is what it is. And you, and you got to learn. And there's nothing that changes that you have to learn and and but if you live by be flexible yeah and and you look at for ways to improve don't become stagnant 
don't become hardcore and don't be out there quoting the law. You know, it's funny because uh, I remember the safety guy come in and go, well, 1910-20, whatever, you can't do this. And it's like, okay, so you're impressing me because you know the numbers of the statute. Okay, that's fine. What do you do? <laughs> the, the idea is, is so what? The idea is you need to be flexible. You need to help. You're here in a service capacity. We're helping our own employer. We're helping our employees. And we're helping our guests, our tenants, our contractors, and so on. We want to get things done right. We want to reduce or minimize the risk. Being flexible, understanding how to communicate, and listening are the important keys here. Makes and that's the takeaway. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Um, my final question is, uh, what books have been influential in your business and or personal lives? God, that changes all the time because I'm always reading white papers. I'm reading magazines. I'm reading books. Uh, Simon, uh, start with why. Simon Sinek is, is an outstanding book. Also his book, Leaders Eat Last which I can really relate to because being in the military, your men eat first, you eat last. Mm -hmm. uh, that's out there. Uh, Ken Blanchard uh, on raving fans is, is another outstanding uh, book. Uh, Jack Welch, The GE Way by Robert uh, Slater is another excellent book. Now, if you want to torture yourself, mm -hmm. you can also read a book called The World is Flat. <laughs> um, if you actually dissect it, it's actually a, a, an excellent piece of material to read, but it's very dry. <laughs> is that the New York Times columnist, um, uh, Thomas Friedman? Yeah, I think so. I, I don't have it in front of me. But, okay. well, um, I'll, I'll, I'll link to those on, uh, on the show notes. Uh, Simon Sinek is a big fan of this show. Well, him not personally. <laughs> well, maybe the other way around because we've had so many guests that have talked about his books. Um, I have listened to them uh, when I used to ride my bike back and forth to work uh, via an audio book. So I, I am also a big fan of that. Uh, it just uh, it makes a lot of sense. He, he opened my eyes uh, quite significantly. Um, a couple Mark. of other real quickies uh, sure. is yes. like who moved the cheese or who moved my cheese that deals with the change management, uh, yep. fish. Uh, I don't know. It's, it's a whole program. It's called fish, fish sticks and fish tails. There's three of them. Uh, again, I'll remember the authors, but I'll look uh, that up. if you ever, if, if you ever been to Seattle and gone to Pike's fish market up there, you actually that's where fish was developed and you're actually having fun and enjoying life and enjoying the customers and you're throwing fish yeah. uh, that's up there so look yeah. that up that's awesome i will put those on the show notes and mark thank you so much for uh coming on talking about risk management talking about your career uh, a big shout out to deidre wright you can look over my shoulder here, there's a whiteboard still with her name on it from the last time she came on the show. She's the one that connected us. But uh, thank you so much for coming on the show. Well, it's been my pleasure. And, and thank you so much for inviting me. My guest this week has been Mark Habersack, the Director of Risk Management at MGM Grand Hotel. Mark, thanks again. Thank you.